Hi, I'm John Schleifer, the Deputy Superintendent, and welcome to the West Seneca Central Schools. We're standing here at the West Elementary School playground, one of seven playgrounds that we have at our seven elementary schools that you'll often see children at during the spring and fall uh, of the school year. Commissioner Mills has talked about raising standards for all children, reporting results, and building local capacity. We're going to expound upon some of those objectives that the commissioner has stated for us today as we show you some of the programs that we've developed in West Seneca. The first program that we're going to take you to is our pupil services program led by Charles Lehman, Assistant Superintendent for Pupil Services. Hi, I'm Charles Lehman. I'm Assistant Superintendent for Pupil Services here in the West Seneca School District. I've been here just a little bit less than two years, uh, 21 months. Uh, joining the district uh, at a time just before we reconfigured all our elementary buildings, so we've, we've had a pretty busy time here in Pupil Services. Um, pupil Services in and of itself is probably something that uh, uh, is a hybrid in many ways. It's uh, not necessarily services that occur in one building, they occur across the district. Uh, and what a district we have. There's about 9,200 children, 9,200, and that's resident children that go to, uh, whether they go to West Seneca schools or private schools, that we serve through pupil services. Uh, with our own district, we have approximately 7,800 children that attend our public schools. Pupil services really relate to um, many types of support services that we provide for children. Uh, besides the general reading, writing, and arithmetic that you would see in a school, we have services uh, provided through school psychology, um, school social work. Uh, we also have educational related support services that we provide through speech improvement, for example, um, counseling sessions, uh, various interventions, program adaptations, and these types of differences that uh, tally up, if you will, uh, tallied up last year to well over uh, 10,000, I think it was 10,450 hours of services that were educational related support services. And that amounts to over 1,930 students that were served through pupil services here in West Seneca. Services of that type come from various professionals. School psychologists, for example, we have five. Five school psychologists that are employed with the West Seneca schools. Um, we also have supplemental support through Erie One BOCES, where we have a part-time school psychologist that works within our district. We have seven full-time social workers, and these are school social workers that are versed uh, working as liaison between school, home, and agencies. Uh, they do uh, personal counseling for students, and they work uh, in conjunction with other therapists that might be working in, uh, in the home. Uh, besides therapy or counseling, uh, we also have supportive groups where we have uh, uh, groups that the psychologists and social workers work together to skill build for children, social skill building, uh, friendship groups, things along those lines. Besides our school psychologists and our social workers that work district-wide, we have 14 school counselors, and those school counselors are at our middle schools, and our high schools. And those individuals are the first adults in pupil services that the students really attach to in our, our middle schools and our high schools. And they're the ones that, besides doing scheduling and being called when academic concerns are there, they're there for the children from a counseling point of view, from a support point of view, and a collaborative point of view, working with our, as, as our other professionals in pupil services, the psychologists and social workers, and liaisons to outside agencies. Along with any other types of services through pupil services, it's not simply um, the psychological support, but it's also the physical support. We have health services throughout this district. We have uh, 14 RNs and three LPNs that are on staff, and it, that staff in and of itself does not only operate in district schools. They operate in the parochial schools, the private schools that are within the district, and we provide a comprehensive health services as prescribed not only by state law, but what we need to do for our children. One of our social workers, Lorraine Probst, is involved in a number of different programs, both in uh, counseling and individual work with children, but uh, in a program that she's been able to put together at one of our elementary buildings, she's done a good amount of enrichment and movement forth to the community, that, that good bond that you'd like to see through a pupil service professional. We work very closely with other members of pupil services department, such as guidance counselors, school nurses, and school psychologists. For example, at Northwood Elementary this year, school psychologist Mr. Jim Scipior and myself co-led uh, a student interest group for 25th and 6th graders. 
The purpose of the group was to promote character development and service to others. The students expressed an interest to work with one of the nursing homes in order to achieve this goal. Mrs. Catherine Bishop, Activities Director of the Garden Gate Nursing Facility, was excited to work with our youth. Uh, Linda Christ, our volunteer coordinator, called me up one day and said, I've got this great project. And so she told me that Lorraine from the schools had called her and was interested in doing something with the kids, but she wasn't quite sure what. And I thought, oh, a play would be great. And I saw spring was coming. I thought maybe an Easter play. Uh, I went to the library and found some, some plays, some skits, and read through them. And uh, it was that. I called Lorraine and said, I've got this great idea. And she was excited and I was excited and so we said, well, we hope the kids are just as excited. And Soon, an Easter play production entitled Baskets or Bonnets involving both the students and the residents as the cast, crew, and costume designers was underway. Oh dear, what's the matter with Pitter and Patter? I was just giving them your orders, Mother Nature, but they won't listen to me. We want CDs to pray, too. The sunbeam saw it last year. This year, it's our turn. Well, there won't be an Easter parade at all unless you raindrops stay at home. You say that every year. Rain, rain, rain go away. Never come on Easter Day. Mother Nature, the four winds are as bad as those raindrops. They all want to blow at once. The fifth graders want to continue next year as sixth graders, and the sixth graders who are moving on to the middle school want to know if a bus can swing by and pick them up <laughs> and come back. So I think you know what it boils down to, Jeff, is the old adage that your grandmother told you that there's much more in life about giving than there is in getting. One of our school psychologists, Jim Sipier, while also being a fine psychometrician working through assessment and, and uh, remediation, works very well in his counseling components together with, collaboratively with social workers and other professionals in our schools. As can be seen in the student interest group presentation, school psychologists and school social workers work together in meeting the needs of students in schools. West Seneca Schools has five and a half school psychologist positions, servicing seven elementary schools, two middle schools, and two high schools. The school psychologists assist students through provision of individual and group counseling in which personal and social issues can be explored and interventions defined. Groups focusing upon issues such as changing families, such as divorce or separation, friendship skills, socialization, and conflict resolution are often offered throughout the school year to promote student adjustment and achievement. One of the primary functions of the school psychologist is to assess student strengths and weaknesses through individual assessments to better define learning potential as well as particular learning styles. This is accomplished through individual psychological evaluations, observations of the student in school, consultation with school staff and with parents, review of school records, use of trial learning experiences as well. Once evaluations are completed, assessment information is communicated to school personnel and to parents to better understand each student's learning preferences. Individual strategies are then developed and implemented in terms of instructional delivery system, environmental modifications, and reasonable accommodations needed to maximize the student's learning potential. As a whole, school psychologists provide a very important and comprehensive service to students, parents, and staff members in the West Seneca schools to promote and maintain student adjustment and maximize their learning potential. Since learning is lifelong, we need to, to provide an alliance between home and school. And that alliance between home and school really provides a, a, a complex structure that moves the student through their developmental stages, moving them through achievement, through growth, and ultimately to success. I guess an effective pupil service department really should support the mission of the school district. And in this department, supporting the mission of the West Seneca S Central Schools, we have worked through assessment and remediation in these almost two years so far. And now we'll continue to move towards enhancing our abilities for assessment and for remediation, of course. But now we really want to focus upon prevention and enrichment. And the prevention and enrichment component of pupil services is what you're going to be seeing for the year 2000-2001. We have an academically and talented group of youngsters that 
begin in third grade and participate through sixth. That is changing this coming year. We're going to go from third grade through eighth grade. And our academically and talented kids very often end up in the advanced placement courses. That's not to say other students do not have an opportunity to participate as well, for we have an enro open enrollment in the program. We have 11 different advanced placement classes that we offer in West Seneca between our two high schools, and you're going to get an opportunity to meet a couple of the teachers of those classes. In this classroom, we're teaching both syllabi. The uh, region syllabus, which is designed for the average ability uh, junior in New York State, and um, once that level is accomplished, we try to work at the uh, actual content of the freshman chemistry class in college. As a matter of fact, in class this year, I have one student who, um, because he's taking AP Chem here, was able to assist his sister, who was taking the identical course at the college level, in fact, using the, the very same textbook. Regis teaches the basic principles. AP goes into it more and more for formulas, a lot more getting the numbers instead of just learning the idea. My students were working with TI-83 uh, plus calculators to record the pressure and volume measurements for a confined gas at a particular temperature. The data is all stored in the memory of the calculator. We took that over to the computers that are here in the classroom and uh, transferred the data from the calculator to the computers and uh, immediately graphs were, uh, were constructed. The graphs were then, uh, we, we determined the best fit for the graphs and uh, eventually the bottom line is that we came out with a verification of the relationship between pressure and volume as uh, an inverse relation. Now if I was to ask you to do this, take the integral of e to the 4x dx. Can we do that? These are the cream of the crop in this class right here. These are the best in this entire school. And in here, we have all kind of work levels and work ethics, and they all have tremendous potential. Every student here has the potential to get a five on the AP exam. But whether they use that or not is entirely up to them. A five means that they are qualified to go into any college and skip the first year of calculus because they've got it down. A four means they are very well prepared and almost every college will take a four as having gone through the course in the college and they get college credit for it. A three means they're well prepared in the sense that they could probably benefit from taking the college course and anything under a three they should definitely take the college course and this would be a great preparatory course for that. I really do recommend the APs. Whatever, maybe take just the ones that you think you're good at. If you're really terrible at math, don't, don't go for that, just take regular calculus. If you're real good in history, take AP history. It's a lot of work, but it's worth it. It's a good challenge. Okay, the advanced placement examination in English is a skills-oriented examination. There's only one particular essay question in the whole exam to which they have to bring any previous knowledge of a work of literature. The rest has uh, acquired skills and not necessarily uh, memorized material like in a lot of other courses. They, they think if they score two on the examination, they somehow have failed. But I can cite chapter and verse on this, that if you can score two on this exam, you can go off and take any college literature course at any, any level, 200, 300, and get an A in the course if you apply the skills that you've learned just simply getting a two on the AP examination. That, that's a big benefit here. And many of them come back and say, you know, I got an easy A. With the AP, I think that Mr. Neipler has a lot to do with it. He really leads thought-provoking intellectual discussions, and we really delve into the works and really try to discuss them and think about what the author was doing with them. And We don't just read it and then take a test on it. We really try to, to go deeper into it than that. There's two goals. One is to get some credit before you go to college, um, get some background, and then the background that they get can help them to you know, get a nice high average in that class. And some kids will choose to waive it, especially if they're a non-science major. There are many kids that are non-science majors taking advanced placement biology. If you're a music major and you get your freshman science credit waived, great. You know, that leaves you more time to study and more time to take courses that you would like. So 
all of the kids aren't necessarily biology majors. And that was something that I wasn't aware of when I first started teaching. I just assumed that I would have all potential physicians and dentists and physical therapists, and that's not the case. So there are many reasons why they can take advanced placement biology. One of the programs that uh, we're very proud of in West Seneca is our distributive education program. It really emanates from a partnership between our business community and the school district. Our occupational studies coordinator, Mr. Jerry Hathaway, is going to tell you a little bit about our distributive education program. DECA stands for Distributive Education Clubs of America. It's been around since 1950 on a state level. There are over uh, 4,000 members. On a national level, there are over 200,000 members involved in a marketing association for students. Students involved in the DECA chapter activities are students who take on an extracurricular program. It's actually co-curricular because it is associated with the marketing classes. However, all the activities that DECA does are, are extracurricular, meaning that they take place after school hours, weekends, holidays, summertime, etc. Students who participate in DECA have an opportunity to um, apply the skills that they learn in a classroom setting in real life situations, working with real life judges, people from the business community. It's a great partnership between the schools and the business community because the students get a chance to act out those kinds of skills and concepts they've learned in the classroom. And the business community gets to participate with the students, gets to network with them, and also realize that we indeed are teaching what we should be teaching at the high school level. DECA enjoys a, a lot of uh, sponsorships and activity with the business community both on a state and a national level. In our local area, West Seneca, we have some 60 local business people who participate as regional and state judges for us and actually judge the competitions for the students. In addition to that, we have our community service organiza organizations like Rotary, Kiwanis, uh, Lions, our own Teachers Association, the Police Benevolent Association, who actually donates money to send students to state and national competition to help defray the cost of them, of them going to these competitions. Um, at West Seneca East Senior High School, we have Mr. Ken Griffin, who's the DECA coordinator, or the DECA advisor for that group. I'm Ken Griffin. I'm the DECA advisor at West Seneca East Senior High School. I've been involved with DECA for the past 15 years. Uh, I started off in DECA with Mr. Hathaway. Um, I saw that it was a very important part of the distributive education program here at East and uh, how it benefited the students, uh, not only now but later on in life. I currently have uh, 60 student members in DECA and it's probably been 60 for the last four or five years now. The requirements for joining DECA is simply being in uh, a business course at East Senior High School. Uh, I prefer that students be in my Principles of Marketing or my Business Ownership class because what they learn in there uh, is what they go into the competition for uh, at the uh, regional, state, and national levels. On the other side of town at West Senior, we have a brand new DEC advisor. This is her first year as a DEC advisor, and she's been very, very successful and very, very, very active with the students. Her name is Colleen Chrisman. We had a phenomenal year. I had set goals for our chapter, uh, and so far, every step along the way, we have exceeded those goals. The first goal was a membership drive. Um, we more than tripled our membership. There, we have 60 members uh, at this current point. And as far as competition, at the regional level, there's three different levels of competition. Regionals was held locally here at Grand Island. Um, our students did very well. Um, we took uh, 12 students to um, state competition, where they competed at the state level. Uh, the Nationals was incredible. To, to take three students who qualified to go to Nationals, which was held in Louisville, Kentucky. Um, I had a fourth student who was uh, chosen to attend the Leadership Development Conference, which he graduated from that. The type of skills that someone gains from DECA um, are directly related to what our business owners are saying they want in our young people. So DECA is a tremendous organization that is work-based and competency-based that they will take right from school, uh, will help them in other classes, as well as out in the business world. And these are the qualities that our employers today are looking for in our young people. DECA is for everybody. Go DECA, go! In West Seneca, we have a full summer school program one of the phases of that summer school program that we think is particularly effective 
is our summer reading program that's led by Mr. John Todorov. Mr. Todorov is going to talk to you a little bit about some of the interdisciplinary programs that comprise our summer reading program. Hello, my name is John Todorov, and I'm the Director of Language Arts, Social Studies, and Library Media Centers for the West Seneca Central School District. I'm standing in front of the Charles Birchfield Center, uh, and we're highlighting this facility because it will, this summer, become a major focus and a major place and venue for our summer reading program. For those of you familiar with Charles Birchfield, he was a naturalist, a journalist, a watercolorist, and he spent much of his life doing his nature study right here on this site in the beautiful 29 acres of, of area that is bordered at the corner of Union Road and Clinton Street in downtown West Seneca. We're really proud to have this center in the midst of our community and uh, we are prepared to make this a major point of interest for our students as they study uh, the arts, as they study science, as they study animal habitats and animals, and we thought what a great place for us to take our children during our summer reading program during the months of July and August in the year 2000. Our summer program involves uh, inviting children in grades one, two, three, and four who we have identified to be at risk in early reading and writing ability. In order to pursue that path, we have 19 teachers, uh, one of whom is a certified librarian, and we have class sizes of approximately 9 to 11 students per teacher. Uh, this ratio allows us to provide a very, very careful one-to-one, -one, sometimes small group attention to students that need help with their writing and reading, and we can provide them with a very, very enriched curriculum that's, uh, that's steeped in the, in the uh, animal, animal habitat themes. This is my third year doing the summer reading program. Even though it's called the summer reading program, it's actually not just a reading program. We've incorporated ma a math strand this year, um, which is headed by John Serencioni, and the kids will be doing a lot of fun activities involving math, science, reading, and writing. The summer program that we have is fun and exciting for the students. It's not a real summer school type setting. We allow the children to have a lot of flexibility as far as their reading and writing, and we were able to focus in on their individual needs throughout the summer so that it's more of a non-stressful situation for the students. Our goal in the summer reading program is to provide these students that we've identified with an edge. We want to give them an opportunity in the summer to have a little time to freshen their skills, uh, accelerate their growth in reading and writing and speaking and listening. When they come back to school in the fall, to give them an opportunity to catch up and to improve their skills so that they can successfully complete the requirements that New York State has now placed on the early literacy assessments. This is an exciting year for our school district, especially because of the development of the Charles Birchfield Center here in West Seneca. We are delighted to be a part of this educational institution. We're delighted that it's here in our neighborhood and we are extremely happy that we're going to be able to bring our children and our staff members to this wonderful site and explore the wildlife, explore the beauty of nature here in the Charles Birchfield Center. Um, I got involved with the Birchfield Nature and Art Center uh, I guess because of my association with uh, the Birchfield Penny Art Center at Buffalo State College. That was the first, uh, the first association. And of course my association with being a, a lifelong West Seneca resident. Um, the other connection is that uh, I live next door to Charles. My family lived next door to Charles Birchfield when he lived here in Gardenville. And uh, so I have some family history with the Birchfield family and I've been familiar with his work and uh, I've always loved his work. So because of my connections with the Birchfield Center and uh, also with West Seneca and uh, also my, my real desire to help keep this space a green space and to create a facility here where everybody from the, from the community could come and draw or paint or do photography uh, or learn about nature um, was really uh, a wonderful opportunity for me to get involved. It was to be a home for West Seneca Youth Bureau and AmeriCorps office space 
but then there was also to be a museum level exhibition space where we could house not only a permanent exhibit to Charles Birchfield but also we'll have rotating exhibits of other Western New York artists and then it could also be an interpretive center which um, uh, could house classes and information that would support the rest of the 29 acres outside. Now um, there's going to be lots of classes and again depending on the day that you come you might be able to sit in on a painting class or drawing class or sculpting class but you might also be able to take a class on um, uh, tracking through the woods and learn what kind of tracks those are on the ground that you're following along the creek bed. Uh, you may be able to take a wildflower identifying wildflowers or uh, an herb class. We have an, uh, a woman coming in to talk about healing herbs and how to grow them and what they do. And you'll be able to sit at our herb garden, which we're planning, and look at those. Um, in the amphitheater, there'll be an amphitheater. And in the amphitheater, we might have some lovely music. We've got a speaker's bureau. Uh, there will be hiking trails. The hiking trails are probably about a mile and a half of hiking trails. Some are raised wooden platforms over wetlands. Some are along the ground. One path takes you along the creek bed, the other path takes you through a more wooded space. But the nice thing about the trails is they're very comfortable to walk on, they are fully handicapped accessible, and the other thing is you're never so far away from civilization that you feel lost. So if you're not a great hiker, you don't have to be worried about getting lost in the woods, it's very easy to find your way back. It's a children's adventure area where kids are going to be able to come and dig for bones and do all kinds of fun things. There's also a children's play area which has a, uh, a treehouse type of structure that kids can climb on and swing on and just play. It was funded by federal grants primarily and state grants but also the Birchfield uh, Foundation gave us a generous donation uh, towards the building. Um, and then all of the 29 acres is being developed through federal and state funds. I think the, the Birchfield Nature and Arts Center, uh, in addition to being a fantastic tribute to Charles Birchfield, a great watercolorist and a great community member, uh, is also a place where everyone can come and enjoy a, a nice sunny afternoon sitting on a bench reading a book or just walking and being able to be in a beautifully gardened, uh, a beautiful path. Um, it's also a place where you can come and learn new things or try new things and uh, it's also a place to come and have fun and really it's, it's a little, it, it is this beautiful preserved piece of nature right in the middle of a great big suburb really. So we're, we're, pretty, we're pretty blessed that we have this wonderful place to come to and it's not very far. No matter where you live in West Seneca, it's not going to take you more than probably five minutes to get here. So there's something for everyone to enjoy and it's here and it's here for everyone in the community to enjoy and it's open to everybody.